Welcome back, bow enjoyers! Tornado Shot is dead. Long live Ice Shot, the new king of bow builds. So why Ice Shot? Why not Lightning Arrow? I thought you said before that Lightning Arrow was just a superior version of Ice Shot. Well, yes, but the thing with Vol Ice Shot is that it synergizes extremely well with Tornado, whereas Vol Lightning Arrow doesn't work as well. So what exactly is this synergy? Let me show you. Can you tell that I've studied art in college? So when you shoot an enemy with ice shot, on impact the arrow leaves a cone of ice behind that enemy. This makes the skill quite strong for clear but lacking against isolated target. In comes Tornado. Tornado is a two stage spell. In the first stage, which lasts one and a half second, you can hit Tornado with ice shot and therefore with Vol ice shot as well. And if you have Pierce, it's going to hit the Tornado, leave a cone of ice that hits your single target. Then the piercing arrow also hits your single target, effectively doubling your damage. In the stage 2 of Tornado, the Tornado then starts dealing damage to surrounding monsters based on the damage the Tornado registered in stage 1. To make this functional, we automate Tornado via Arcanist brand, effectively keeping Tornado in the first stage for the duration of the Arcanist brand, maximizing the uptime on this double damage interaction with Ice Shot. This niche interaction indubitably pushes Ice Shot above Lightning Arrow. When you cast Vol Ice Shot, you quadruple your damage. When you cast Tornado, you double it again. But you know me, I'm not stopping there. In comes Focus, a temporary state that can be toggled on if you have modifiers that explicitly work while you are focused. These modifiers are unveiled from betrayal encounters and can be benchcrafted on your gear. I use double damage while focused on my bow, attack and gas speed while focused on my gloves, and critical strike chance is lucky while focused on my belt. As a result, you pop a natural, go into hyper focus, and voila, double your damage again. Line up all these conditional sources of damage and you get the temporary godlike experience, obliterating the toughest of monsters in mere seconds. The playstyle is straightforward, you kill packs with good old regular ice shot. If something doesn't die, use focus. If it still doesn't die, cast tornado via Arcanist Brand. And if it doesn't die, cast Vol Ice Shot. If it still doesn't die, just complain on Reddit that the League monsters are overtuned. We scale the damage via three elements and use Trinity support. This is the strongest way to scale damage until you have a headhunter, at which point a physical bow and converting fist cold becomes a better way to scale damage. 
You don't have to worry about Trinity and Resonance, it takes care of itself as long as you have lightning damage on your bow, which you should have anyway since you're looking for the highest elemental DPS bow, and lightning damage tends to have a higher elemental DPS value than other elements on bows. The defenses on this build are not as bad as they initially seem. This is not a 6 portals build. We're obviously rocking a 100% chance to suppress spell damage, but also increasing spell suppress effectiveness through Inveterate, the 3% Mastery, and the well-rolled Elevor. This will negate all small spell hits that could otherwise shotgun you, while making bigger hits more manageable. For attacks, we rely heavily on chance to evade, acquired mostly through evasion thanks to Grace and a Jade Flask rolled with increased evasion that we boost further by grabbing increased flask effect and flask sustain on the tree. The remaining chance to evade we get is from a Watcher's Eye and Wind Dancer, getting us to the cap of 95% chance to evade. In other words, you're taking 1 in 20 attacks to the face, the 19 remaining ones are effectively negated. Path of Building does not reflect evasion properly in the effective hit pool calculations, so the build seems way squishier than it actually is when you import it. If you want to see what your EHP really is versus attacks, go into Configuration, Enemy Stats, Enemy Damage Type and select Melee. For our sustain we use Instant Leech. This is self-explanatory, it's Leech, it's instance, very OP. Finally, a bit of a controversial take, I'm capping my resistances through a Bismuth Flask. Allow me to explain. First, with our increased flask effect, we're getting 48% to all elemental resistances. This is equivalent to 3 tier 1 resistance suffix on gear, which can instead be damage suffix such as attack speed, crit multi, projectile speed, etc. You'll find that you get more damage through 3 suffix than you would if you put a damage flask instead of the bismuth flask, such as a diamond flask. So the only problem is that we die if the flask ever runs out, right? But it doesn't run out. First, we enchant it via the crafting bench with reused at the end of flask effect. This is very important. We just press the flask once in every map and it will keep going until it runs out. Secondly, the bismuth flask has a high base duration of 8.5 seconds, which gets increased to 15 seconds with 20% quality and our flask duration investment on the tree. It also only consumes 15 charges per sip, which is the lowest of all utility flasks. With the 40 base charges, you can take 2 sips before it runs out. But if you increase its maximum charges via prefix by at least 20 to maximum charge, you can then take 4 sips before it runs out. At over 15 seconds uptime per sip, you're looking at over a minute of uptime without generating charges through killing monsters. So this flask, it never gonna run out. But it doesn't stop there. This Bismuth Flask concept also has a strong synergy with a modifier from using an Essence of Delirium on a belt, granting 50% to Chaos Resistance during Flask Effect, which makes it very easy to cap your Chaos Resistance in conjunction with Prismatic Catalyst and Amethyst Rings. I've used this technology for over 100 hours, and it never failed me. As for leveling, it's a breeze. Every boss gets obliterated. Follow the POB. Everything is in there. I've put a lot of time testing every possible passive tree pathing in skill combinations, whether it's Mana Forge Arrow setup, Ballista setup, just to make sure that I offer you today the best progression possible. There's just a few things you need to be mindful of with the passive tree. First of all, we allocate Precise Technique Keystone in the early game to grant us 40% more damage as long as your accuracy is higher than your life which the tree should take care of until maps, at which point you should buy an Iris Truth unique amulet and change your gems around to include crit, crit multi as well as power charge on crit on your mana forge setup so that you can respect out of precise technique and start scaling your damage via crits. Also, we allocate the life mastery 15% increased life if you have no life modifier on your body armor. This includes maximum life and life regen so make sure you don't have either of those stats on your body armor. Finally, we take the Evasion Mastery for 15% chance to suppress spell damage if helmet, body armor, gloves and boots all have evasion. So make sure to look for evasion bases when you're shopping or crafting those equipment. As for gearing, during leveling you can use some cheap leveling uniques such as Prism Weave, Care Reward, Unders Clasp and Hyrie's Bite. You'll want a high attack speed bow with as much elemental DPS as you can afford. 
For your body armor, remember that you don't want life modifiers on it, so you can benefit from the mastery. And the body armor is also an excellent piece of equipment where you can increase your effective hit pool via a lot of flat armor and evasion, which then gets scaled with your increase to evasion on your tree. It truly makes a massive difference while leveling. If you want to know more, you can check my previous video where I go over it. Try to get movement speed on boots, and the rest of the gear you just want resistance, life and flat damage. Your flasks are very important. They are a core part of the build, so make sure to give them some love. Even while leveling, craft them with increased sustain either through less charges used, more duration or maximum charges, as well as increasing their power via increased evasion, movement speed, attack speed armor, and corrupted blood immunity. In the late game, the modifiers you'll want to look for are life, critical strike multiplier, projectile speed, attributes, resistances, and open suffixes to handcraft all the focus modifiers that you need. You can also look for some cool implicits like grace effect on body armor. You can also have action speed on boots, plus the level of seconded aura gems as a corruption on your helmet, and intimidate and pierce on gloves. Once you acquire the interrogation jewel, it will replace your elemental ailments you inflict from ignite, chill, freeze, and shock to scorch, brittle, and sap which increases your damage and survivability, but also prevents your freeze. This is a good time to explain how I make Berserk work on this build. To start with, we need to generate Rage to use Berserk. Rage comes from stunning enemies that are affected by Warlord's Mark. You don't need any investment in stun to make it work. The only caveat at this stage is that you cannot stun an enemy on the same hit you freeze them, and you freeze them when you crit them as long as you're dealing cold damage. With the interrogation jewel, you cannot freeze, so you always stun. If you don't have the jewel, you will still stun, but only on hits that you do not crit with. Next, we automate Warlord's Mark in two ways. First, it gets cast by a cast on crit setup on your Mana Forge arrow setup, so you need high crit chance for that to work. Then, thanks to your focal point ascendancy, Warlord's Mark will jump from monsters to monsters as you slay them. The reason we trigger it via cast on crit is so that it can affect magic and normal monsters, whereas our Sniper's Mark will be mostly used against rare monsters thanks to Mark on Hit support, which only works against rare and unique monsters. To trigger your Mana Forge arrow setup, you need to spend 300% of its mana cost with other bow skills. This means that you must balance your mana cost between costing too much which means having mana issues, or costing too little, which means having Mana Forge arrow trigger rate issues. So if you have difficulties generating rage, it can be any of these systems not working properly. Make sure your Ice Shot mana cost is higher than zero, so that you spend mana to trigger your Mana Forge setup. You can adjust the cost by changing Inspiration for another support gem and adjusting the bench craft on your rings or the reduced cost implicit on your helmet. I've put the PUB in the description as well as the link to my forum guide and the link to my Discord server where all my fellow bow enjoyers can come and talk about bows and help each other out. I'll try to get many crafting videos out in Necropolis League, so if it's something that interests you, make sure to subscribe. Have a great league start and see you next time.